Hello again. In this episode, we will walk you through Crystal's basic constructs, its built in types, and its type system. For the sake of convenience, we will work on the Crystal Playground, which allows you to write, compile, and run code in a simple web page. To start a playground, run Crystal Play and open your browser at localhost 8080. As you can see, we can type a simple program here and it gets compiled and run on the spot. On the right, the playground shows the line-by-line -line execution of the program, along with the data type of each expression. The basic types are the ones you would expect, booleans, strings, symbols, characters and numeric types, including signed and unsigned integers, and floats of different sizes. Crystal also has lists, represented by the array class, and their contents are strictly typed as well. This means that you cannot have just a list. Your list needs to have a specific type, such as integers. In this case, Crystal infers that the array contains integers. If we mix different types, like this, then the array will contain a union of integers and strings. As you become more familiar with the language, you'll notice that union types are one of the most powerful features of Crystal. We can restrict the type of a variable in a context by using the isA method. Note that inside the if branch, lm is shown as an integer, not as an integer or a string. In Crystal, all types are non-nillable by default. If we add a nil to our array, know that its type changes to a union that includes the nil class. Crystal will keep us from invoking methods on a nillable object without checking. Also, know that if we declare an empty array, the compiler has no way to know what its contest will be, so it forces us to declare its type. The same applies to dictionaries, called hashes in Crystal, just like in Ruby. Crystal also inherits from Ruby the concept of blocks, which are used much along the standard library, in particular in functional higher order functions such as map and select. We can simplify this expression using ranges, and further by using the ampersand shorthand syntax for simple blocks. In fact, blocks are so used in Crystal that they are also used for iteration. Crystal supports both the do and syntax and the curly braces for defining blocks. Last but not least, Crystal also has tuples and name tuples, which are a great way to quickly define complex types without resorting to classes. Note that tuples and name tuples are both immutable. Crystal also has a pointer as a basic data type for interacting with low-level, non-managed code, though that goes beyond the scope of this episode. Now, even though Crystal is statically typed, the types of most expressions are inferred by the compiler. For instance, let's define a twice function. Functions in Crystal are declared with the def keyword, like in Ruby. If we invoke this function with a number, the compiler will correctly infer the resulting type to be a number as well. Same if we use a string, where the result is the concatenation. But the compiler will complain if we invoke it with a type that does not support the plus operator. Under the hood, the compiler is checking for all usages of your twice function and compiling a version for ints and another for strings, and statically linking to the appropriate one in each call. This makes the execution much faster. If you want to specify the argument types for a function, you can do it like this. So now, if we try to invoke it with a string, we get an error from the compiler. We can define multiple overloads of the function for different argument types, and Crystal will pick the right one in each case. By the way, this is how you interpolate strings in Crystal. Again, same to syntax as Ruby. So in this chapter we reviewed Crystal's basic data types and constructs, and took a small peek into type inference, type restrictions, and method overloading. In the next episode, we'll go one step further and work with classes, generics, and macros. Thanks for watching!